this is on strategy, innovation, and management. And then we have a technology business, uh, which has been in the industry for about three and a half years, called Crypto Savannah. And at Crypto Savannah, we build various products and services um, using blockchain and emerging technologies to, in order to meet uh, the market demands. It's a delight for ourselves to be a part of this panel on the digital economy. And we look forward to learning from others and as well sharing from our experience. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Rubunda. It's just interesting when you begin speaking about the issue of uh, blockchain technologies. We are seeing a lot of people preaching the gospel of blo blockchain. Just a quick one. Could you please tell us what is Uganda's intake right now when it comes to the adoption of uh, blockchain technologies? Sorry, did you say intake or intake? The intake of Uganda's intake when it comes to adopting blockchain technology. Okay. So at an adoption level, um, the governance structure in order to support adoption is in place, meaning there is a legal regime that is favorable. Um, particularly, there's a, uh, the Financial Intelligence Authority is mandated in order uh, by law to uh, register businesses that are involved in what are known as virtual assets, so virtual asset service providers. Um, that is one component. Um, the central bank currently has in place what is known as a blockchain working group, um, which is particularly looking at how this technology can support uh, central banks and the entire uh, banking industry. Um, there is the national blockchain strategy, which is uh, available online, uh, that was put together by Ministry of ICT. So at a framework level, the support is extensive. Then there is also a lot of activity in the community, meaning uh, software developers, meaning entrepreneurs, meaning young people who are testing out blockchain and the value that it can bring um, in industry. And so we are seeing blockchain applications being developed in fintech, in agriculture, in education, just like our sister from um, this is on the panel right now, Irene, is involved with. So there's development that is happening in, in various sectors. So therefore, I've spoken both at a policy level and I've also spoken at an industry level. And I hope that gives a, a good summary of as a response to your question on the intake of blockchain technology. Thank you very much. Uh, that's a very interesting summary because when you look at the growing uh, technologies, you'll find that blockchain is being adopted by various countries. And, uh, and Uganda also you find that there are quite a number of people who are beginning to set up this drive. I know there was one time a think tank that was created, the presidential think tank on blockchain. I think we shall be hearing more about that uh, I will get into that. Let me get uh, to Irene. Irene, briefly tell us, how do you envision Uganda to be in the next five years when it comes to the digital space? So, uh, first of all, I believe Uganda will be a leader in the, in the technology space and the digital economy space. And why do I say that? I'm, I'm so amazed by the number of entrepreneurs, digital entrepreneurs that are sprouting up every other day. And we as Uganda have an advantage. First of all, majority of our population is quite young. That means they're very technically skilled and very literate. So that in itself is a big advantage that the government and the private sector can leverage on to build and promote digital economies and digital transformation. Of course, as we continue to build the gap and bridge the gap between those that are illiterate who are you know, a big number, as well as this young population that is very technically skilled. And uh, in, when I now come to speak to the space of digital identities, um, I do know that we have come a long way, first of all, for many of us Ugandans to have an identity. And I believe there is a plan to also digitize these identities. And I'm very passionate about digital identities because I believe when each and every person, each and every business has a digital identity, it will open up so many opportunities for them, both internationally as well as nationally. Someone will not have to worry about 
proving who they are, what they have done, what they can do, because they'll be able to access that information digitally. And five years from now, I believe that Uganda will hopefully have an EID that can enable we nationals to access those opportunities and that investment. So that's where I believe Uganda is going. Yeah, when you, you, you bring up the uh, pertinent point of the Uganda's digital identity, we have seen uh, the national ID as one of the one of the projects that Uganda has embarked on, and I think every Ugandan has now a, a national ID. Uh, do you think that just the, the national ID as a project of its own has a strong relationship to the digital identity drive that Uganda is heading towards? Definitely, I think it does. And the fact that we have managed to get at least majority of the Ugandans having that ID is a great step. Now, what we need to do is to digitize that ID. We have at least the infrastructure, uh, the sensitization that has gone around that, you know what, you need an ID. So that sensitization is going around. Now, when we digitize that, it will even open up so many other opportunities. So I feel and I believe the fact that we, as many Ugandans, have these ideas is a great step forward towards digitizing them. And once we digitize them, more people will be able to access that digital economy. Because uh, one of the many aspects that is important in this digital economy is not just software and e-commerce and hardware, but it's also human capital. People like you and I, entrepreneurs that own businesses, and these people and entrepreneurs need that identity. In this case, they'll need an, a digital ID to be able to open up those opportunities to them. So I believe once we are able to all identify ourselves digitally, we are also able to access more opportunities that the digital economy provides. Yeah, yeah that is really great. I can see that uh, there is a lot of... Uh, hanging fruits that are coming in, especially when it comes to Uganda's digital identity. Yeah. Let me just simply get back very fast to Rugunda, who is joining us uh, live on Zoom. Uh, could you please just simply tell us uh, about uh, what does Uganda's digital future look like? Yes, I would like to start by reiterating um, what Irene said, and I fully agree with the views that she has shared. Um, Uganda's digital future is bright. It's actually very bright. And we happen to have a series of ingredients that will enable for this brightness to be realized. And I really talked about young, young people, a young population. The young population is such a critical ingredient because these are both uh, their consumer drivers, meaning they will be purchasing these goods and services. Not only are they young, but they're also growing up uh, in a tech-savvy environment. So that makes them, that shortens the curve in terms of understanding these services. And many of them are uh, entrepreneurs themselves and, and young business people. So the fact that there's a young population is one critical ingredient that it's a bright future. The fact that uh, we are seeing our internet prices dropping. Internet prices have been high, but they're continuing to drop significantly. And with continued lowering of internet prices, there is increased adaptability. So more people are able to take on internet services, develop applications on them. Um, and that is the key infrastructure that requires to be in place in order for the digital economy to thrive. Uh, thirdly, I can also add that we are in a nascent ecosystem. And a nascent ecosystem that has primarily been producing uh, raw materials. And therefore, there is unique opportunity for others of value, meaning value addition through digital means, to be applied to these raw materials in order to increase their value. This is so important because it, it, it highlights the, uh, the, the great landscape of opportunity that is available in the digital economy. So therefore, in conclusion, I share fully what Irene has said, the digital economy, the future of the digital economy is bright for our country, and it's really us to harness it and to grab it and make the most of the opportunity. Yeah, uh, thank you very much uh, for that response. Uh, we've seen uh, a lot of uh, young innovators coming up, and uh, during this uh, innovation week, we have seen the youngest uh, innovator uh, participating in the 
innovation hours which is uh innovation hours a nine year old uh, called by the names of umpaji Ann, and uh, she came up with uh, a small digital a digital platform whereby one can be able to follow the curriculum or do a self-study uh, about uh, at home so when you begin to see that uh, innovators as young as uh, nine years are beginning to join this innovation space do you think the children have a paramount role to play in, in regarding to the future of the digital innovations in the country Irene, what do you have to say about this um, definitely they do have a role to play and uh, I, when i interact with a lot of parents you hear parents telling me that my children are teaching me how to use whatsapp uh, my children are teaching me how to use zoom uh, during the covid 19 pandemic i had to help my dad get onto zoom i literally taught him how to use zoom so we see that the education and sensitization it's not just going to be us as the private sector or the government or the schools that are sensitizing people about these different tools and technologies but these young children that actually understand these technologies much faster than we do are going to play a big role to teach us so i i would i would even just consider them as little children but i consider them as important actors towards pushing us to digital transformation yeah great uh, that is interesting because when it comes to the issues of children my passion for children and innovation it's like it gets packed up and i see that there is at least uh, a future when it comes to children um i'd like to also introduce uh michael Nitereka, who has also joined us uh, on zoom michael do you mind giving us uh, an introduction about yourself and then also how do you envision uganda's uh, digital future michael Michael, uh, uh, I think Michael is still having some challenges trying to connect. But uh, also, I'd like to introduce our panelists from the Innovation Village. Innovation Village has been driving a lot of innovations within uh, in Uganda, and uh, we have uh, we have uh, Samantha on the uh, on the on Zoom. Samantha, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, glad to be here. Uh, glad to be part of. Uh... Uh, this event. Um, I'm Samantha Minsova and I work at the Innovation Village and we support um, entrepreneurs that are solving the most critical challenges in our community, leveraging technology, and we work with uh, partners to tap into these opportunities to scale the solutions and to create impact in the community. Um, may I just ask, was there a question that was directed? Uh, could you tell me that if, if, if it was? Samantha, the question that uh, I have for you this morning is uh, how do you envision Uganda's digital future in the next five years? Uh, that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, and given the fact that, one, we're a very young population, and two, um, a, lot of, um, a lot of our areas are still unconnected. So there is a vast opportunity um, for us to leverage technology to reach the less connected areas. Um, and that, of course, would drive one, uh, job creation and economic recovery. Um, I do believe that um, steps are being taken um, for us to, to reach that impact in the next five years, but there is uh, a greater need for us to tie collaboration with different ecosystem players for us to that, us identifying um, the role to us needs to play wherever we're at, um, if it's corporates, if it's developmental agencies, if it's government, if it's private institutions, how do we come together to uh, leverage the opportunity uh, to tap into the in the next five years? Okay, uh, that's really great because there are quite a number of opportunities uh, that Uganda can be able to hold on to such that they can be able to tap into the, the global digital drive. 
and uh, these opportunities, there is an information gap whereby we find that uh, innovations are not scaled across. Uh, let me just get back to Samantha. Samantha, uh, the innovation village, I still don't understand the concept of the innovation village and when it comes to reaching out to the potential innovators. What is the innovation village doing to be able to build the digital economy in the far remote areas whereby they have uh, inaccessibility in terms of uh, achieve, uh, accessing the digital divide? Where is the digital divide and what is the innovation village doing to be able to bridge this digital divide? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, one, I would say that the Innovation Village was established understanding that we have uh, what we call a broken ecosystem. Because when you look at our neighboring countries, Kenya, um, even Rwanda, right, um, is that they're far ahead of the digital innovation space uh, more than, 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 than us. And it's, just, it's not just one issue, it's a number of issues. So as the Innovation Village, we, um, we're sort of trying to address the various issues um, in terms of community, building a presence of, of, um, of tech entrepreneurs to collaborate with each other, um, future lab, um, working with corporates to leverage um, existing solutions um, to tackle specific challenges. Um, you know, the 97 fund, which is bringing together capital to invest in startups. So again, tapping into um, the opportunity that the different problems um, capital opportunity and to support the problems that are, that are there. And of course, then the regional presence. Um, in that we understand that the issue is not just in Kampala, it's in Rumu, it's in Jinja, it's in Mbara. So I would say the most key is working with, um, with different stakeholders in addressing the challenges using technology uh, solutions and working to scale them. I hope that. I hope that yeah, Sorry? thank you very much, uh, Samantha. Um, as you see that uh, the digital divide is slowly narrowing, there's a lot of accessibility to mobile devices, there's uh, accessibility to the internet. We're beginning to have an internet penetration rate of approximately 75% where of Ugandans having access uh, to the internet through their mobile phones. And we've seen technology transitioning from uh, the 3G, 4G, and uh, there are some basic devices which used to use which use edge internet. But now with uh, the growth of 4G, uh, we're seeing the technology and the digital device slowly narrowing. A lot of services are going digital, and uh, one can be able to buy their bus tickets. Because I'll give an example. One of the startups in uh, that has exhibited here at Corolla called uh, Kasaiba, and the, one can be able to buy bus tickets for their events right on their phone. That's an example of the transition of digital, of the digital economy. Uh, we have Michael, who has joined us from Refactory. Michael, welcome to this uh, digital economy live panel on, on projecting what Uganda's digital future is. Uh, Michael, kindly introduce yourself such that the audience can be able to know who you are, and then uh, you can briefly give us a description of what uh, you think Uganda will be able to be like in the next five years. Michael. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Daniel uh, and the host. Um, a pleasure being part of this panel. Um, apologies for joining a little bit later. As, yeah. The factory is one of the initiatives that I'm currently involved in. Um, our primary focus is to address the skills gap that does exist in the digital ecosystem. And, and the reason why we are having this is that uh, there is a big issue, a big issue. If, if, if companies are going to grow, they will need people. If, if we're going to grow the entire ecosystem, we must have the right kind of talent that has the capacity to, to scale. And so we factory came in to bridge the gap between university and the world of work. And, and that's where we need place ourselves um, and we look for anybody who has a level of interest and passion and is interested in IT or specifically software uh, development. We have now 
started progressing to looking at other verticals and uh, working with um, the friends of mine, Kwame and Noah around the blockchain association. And I think our intention is also to bring on board um, programs like blockchain, um, do data science, and, and a number of other initiatives. Now, the key thing is to focus on skill. But when you hire somebody, this person has the capacity to deliver what you're looking for. That's number one. Number two is that, so if, if, if I look at five years from now, what are we going to look like? I think we have to be very intentional. We cannot claim that these things are going to come to us. No, we're going to work hard. We're going to make sure that we are there. And if we work hard, we will definitely be able to reap the benefits that come with the digital um, enhancement, digital capabilities. We will have unicorns in Uganda um, that are able to raise a million or a billion dollars in, in terms of revenue. So, so, so the, 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 the future is bright. But you see, it is not a guaranteed. It, it's not that you're going to find it on, on your plate given to you. It's going to be hard work. And so working with partners like the Innovation Village, working with uh, the Blockchain Association, FITS, uh, and all these other things, it has to be a collective effort if you're going to raise and, and appreciate the real value that comes with the digital economy. And I, I hope that makes sense then. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Michael. And that uh, makes a lot of sense, especially when you look at uh, the uptake of uh, technology in Uganda right now. And just to get back on what is happening at Kololo right now, it, about one of the innovations I'll mention about, it's called Kawalet, whereby uh, students can be able to have uh, their parents send pocket money without uh, one necessarily having a mobile money account. So meaning that the current Ugandan policy does not allow students to have mobile phones uh, in their in their hands at school. So, in case the student is in a boarding school, how can the parent remit money? So, this Kawalet innovation uh, is one that leverages on uh, digital currencies or, or fintech to be able to disrupt the education system when it comes to sending finances. Uh, let me just simply get back to Rugunda. Um, We've been speaking about the fourth industrial resolution uh, and the modes of payment. Uh, and they say that it's said to be completely, it's going to completely transform the way we transact businesses. Uh, and uh, also, how can we be able to share value when it comes to the way we transact? Could this be true that uh, the fourth industrial resolution is going to be a game changer? And then, what is the impact of this 4IR? Uh, the fourth industrial revolution, and how is it going to be able to affect some of our systems, how, how some of our transactions that are coming in? Rugunda? Uh, thank you. So, um, I think to give some context on the fourth industrial revolution, um, it's important to contextually appreciate what it is. And oftentimes there is a reference to the previous industrial revolutions, and I'll just summarize it in the interest of time. Uh, the first industrial revolution, primarily when steam engines came into existence, and this transformed Europe. This is what created uh, England and Europe to be global superpowers. The second industrial revolution was when electricity was uh, created, and then the light bulb and James Watt, and lit up the world, literally and metaphorically. The third, which is the infrastructure for the fourth, happened over the last uh, 30 years, or, I mean, in our own lifetime when we saw uh, electronic communication, which the most important highlight was the internet. Now, the internet is so important because it makes uh, knowledge ubiquitous. It spreads knowledge and enables people to access information. Previously, the holder of information was the controller of power. But what the internet has enabled is for information to be massively available to everyone anywhere around the world at any time. In other words, me sitting in Kampala, in Ntinda, in Boise, in Boyogedele, I'll have the exact same information as someone sitting in San Francisco, in Paris, in Tokyo, in London. Therefore, because of this point of access to information, knowledge has now been made publicly and abundantly available. That is the foundation layer. When you have that foundation layer of knowledge in place, then you can do a myriad of other things on top. So that is the third industrial revolution. 
among these things that have been built on top of the internet are a series of technologies that are now being called the fourth industrial revolution. And it's the convergence of these technologies. Whether there is, and there's a series of them, there's artificial intelligence, there's blockchain, there's internet of things, and many others. So the convergence of these technologies is creating a new world. And this new world is what we're calling the fourth industrial revolution. And it opens up a myriad of opportunities. You were just mentioning uh, right now about uh, the students using digital technology, digital currencies to disrupt education. You were speaking a few minutes ago about a nine-year-old uh, young lady who was uh, the youngest innovator um, being displayed this week. So you can see the technologies that they're referring to and that they're using are, are convergence. So we see the fourth industrial revolution as unleashing a million opportunities, enabling for creation, storage, transaction of value, of new type of value. And, um, and this is going to happen in all sectors, whether it is agriculture, which is a backbone of our economy, where we are seeing uh, smart agriculture now happening, whether it is the way people plant, whether it is the way farmers access information um, about weather patterns, about better farming methods, and so on, whether it is in the education sector, uh, whether it is in trade. So we are seeing the impact of these technologies beginning in various sectors of our economy. And mind you, this is just the beginning. We are soon going to see the impact of artificial intelligence. We are going to see, uh, soon see new types of jobs being created. The people that uh, Michael Nietzsche was talking about at the factory that are being trained, they are being given foundation skills in order to prepare them for this new type of jobs and this new type of work. So we are seeing a whole new world that is emerging as a result of the fourth industrial revolution. And therefore, in conclusion, in terms of the question that you raised, Uganda currently has in place um, a national blockchain task, a national uh, task force on the fourth industrial revolution. I happen to be a part of it, and so does Michael. And this national task force on the fourth industrial revolution has actually put together a strategy, a strategy, a proposed strategy in which Uganda can embrace the opportunity that the fourth industrial revolution enables while taking into consideration important risks like uh, challenges of connectivity, challenges of digital divide, and so on. And these, uh, this strategy is publicly available, and it's uh, being proposed uh, to cabinet and the government of Uganda in order to adopt such that Ugandans can take advantage of what the fourth industrial revolution enables. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Rugunda, for that. Uh, when you begin to speak about transactions, when you begin to speak about blockchain technologies, uh, where does the country position itself regarding to this? Uh, right now, we have uh, we we, we, discuss, we know that we have uh, various key players that uh, play an unimportant role in the regulation of fiscal policy and fintech in the in the country. Uh, Today, I'm happy to say that we have uh, Jacinta Anyange from Bank of Uganda. Uh, let me welcome her and. Uh, I'll welcome uh, Jacinta. You mind introducing yourself further? Uh, thank you very much. I hope I'm loud and clear. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, my name is Jacinta Anini. I uh, just need to correct the pronunciation of that name. And I'm a corporate lawyer with over 15 years' experience in the financial sector regulation, with 11 years currently as in house counsel at the Central Bank of Uganda. And my career focus has always been on contract negotiation, drafting of regulatory strategy that identifies and addresses gaps in the financial sector, policy development, financial sector law drafting, guidelines and provision of legal and regulatory advice in the financial sector. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, sorry for that pronunciation. Actually, I come from the East, probably pronouncing those names from the North could be a little bit challenging, but I'll take you by the names of Jacinta. Jacinta, we very well know that the key component of the digital economy is money. And uh, what is the future of money from your perspective? And uh, what is the uh, Bank of Uganda trying to do towards uh, changing the way we handle our money? Jacinta? Thank you very much. Uh, as regards the future of money, I think we have already seen what is happening all over the world. 
we are seeing the development of uh, and then the implementation of the central bank digital currencies happening all over. We've seen it in the Caribbean. We are also seeing it happening right now in West Africa. Nigeria has gone far with it. Uh, I just want to say that we currently have a working group that doing some, we are doing some groundwork to see the viability of how we can issue a central bank digital currency. This hasn't yet come out publicly. We are still doing underground work as regards that issue. So I'm sure when we are done, this will come out and we shall involve a number of stakeholders. But we are doing something about it. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's great that you're doing something about it because I, I wouldn't be very comfortable to see Uganda being left behind in this digital trend. And uh, in Africa, Uganda has been so much at the front of a lot of innovations. Um, personally, I joined the innovation space uh, way back. That was in uh, the year 2004, 2005. By the, by the time, the uptake of innovation was slowly changing. Mobile money transactions coming in. Uh, computers were beginning to take shape and uh, everything. But if you're to, com if you're to compare... At uh, that position and the current situation of the country, then you find that there is a lot that has changed. Uh, let me just give the floor back to uh, Samantha. Samantha, Uganda has tried to simulate innovation both in the private sector and even in the public sector. We, however, get far behind the likes of countries like Kenya and Nigeria. What, uh, what are we missing in this uh, innovation drive? And uh, how can we be able to improve this, Samantha? Yeah. So um, one of the one of the uh, things I mentioned before was uh, collaboration. Um, is the collaboration in the ecosystem is still lacking, and um, identifying innovation and technology as um, as a gateway to solve particular challenges. But at the same time, using that with uh, collaboration opportunities with different stakeholders. Um, so you find that we, um, at times, are working in silos in addressing different needs um, instead of tapping into the opportunity for us to work together. Sorry? Yes. Um, and one critical element also is, is identifying innovation for, for shared value. Um, and that means that how can we take the idea of shared value in advancing sustainable development without using, without losing profitability? Um, and part of that innovation is also tied to um, technology and advancing the digital economy. So we find that most organizations are, um, are still in the traditional sense of, of CSR and social responsibility. Um, and yet there's a principle of shared value, which is actually creating economic value by addressing needs and challenges. So um, shooting two, two, two birds with one stone, uh, but of course that, um, that mindset shift is, is something that is critical for us in the ecosystem to understand how we can tap into shared value, tap into collaboration to advance the digital economy. Uh, thank you very much for that. I think a lot of collaboration is needed here. Very quickly, let me get to Irene. Irene, you mentioned something about uh, getting our digital identities for every Ugandan. Is it the government's role? What do you think the government can do? But we are touching a very critical field of digital identity. Does the private sector have a pertinent role that it can do <laughs> in this drive of the private sector as well as the government sector? And the only way we can move forward is if those parties work together. So like Samantha said, we need to collaborate to be able to move forward. And to further elaborate, I just want to add on, on a couple of things that my fellow panelists say. Number one, inclusivity. If we are to enable digital IDs to be, uh, be able to be accessed by anyone and everyone, as we build our systems, as we build our platforms, they need to be inclusive. And uh, just to give an example of what we as Duala have done, is that 
We have understood and come to learn in our work that not everyone has a smartphone. So we have enabled even the person who does not have a smartphone to be able to digitally receive their certificate or credential, share it for verification and store it. So that's one aspect of inclusivity. So inclusivity is also key to being able to open up this digital ID space to each one and every one. Then the second thing that uh, I would like to elaborate on is what Michael said about skilling. Yes, we have a young population that is tech literate, that is moving things very fast, but we also have this population that probably has no idea about how to go on their smartphone. They don't understand the value of digital technologies. When we tell them about digital technologies, there's a sense of distrust because they don't understand the value. And if you are building, for example, the digital ID to cater to each and every Ugandan, this gap needs to be enclosed. This gap needs to be bridged. And it takes both the private sector, for example, what the factory is doing, it takes the government sector, the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of uh, Science and Innovation, all of us together. What programs can we create towards killing not just a few people but the entire economy. Then lastly, uh Common talked about the internet that yes the internet penetration has increased, yes the prices have gone lower, but can they be lower? Yes, they can be lower. And when I sit and envision Uganda 10 years from now or five years from now, I envision myself walking into Kisoro district where I come from and not having to pay for internet, simply pulling out my gadget and being able to ex access the Wi-Fi. I believe internet penetration and internet affordability will also be a big catalyzer towards the implementation and adoption of digital identities. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Irene, for that. I, I picked just a, a couple of points. One is inclusiveness and uh, in, an, 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 an enabling environment for innovations. If we are to look at those two things, uh, there's going to be a need for a drive towards scaling uh, the population to be able to build various innovations. Um, we know that at, factor, at Refactory, there is something interesting that they're doing. Michael, just to get you uh, on this, uh, what are uh, some of these uh, digital skills? What role does the digital skills play uh, in setting up the path to a fully realized uh, digital economy? Uh, is there any gap that uh, we are having in this uh, skilling? And then how can we be able to ensure that the government and the private sector can be able to solve these uh, gaps? Michael? Um, thank you. Thank you, Daniel. I... So there are two, three things that you, you, you raised there. How critical is this in terms of the digital economy? I, I think it is the heart of it. Um, my brother Kwame will, will, will share with you that uh, the number of companies that, that, that attempt to come into this country and the first thing they ask you, how, how easy is it to find talent? And, and so if you don't have talent or if you don't have a talent strategy, it means that the cost of doing business in your country is going to be extremely expensive. And because of that, then you're, you cease to be very attractive. And, and I guess that's why you see quite a number of entities are willing to, to let's say, set up in Nigeria or in Kenya because it's very easy to find talent that is ready. So, so one of the things we're really trying to address is how do we get people industry ready? Now, of course, we are we, we, we're in an environment where people focus so largely on qualification. So if you get a degree, if you have a diploma, yes, that, that, that's very good. But we've come to a point where industry doesn't really care about what qualifications you have. And so at Refactory, we take on anybody that has an interest. We take on high school students, we take on guys who are from senior four, and guess what? There's no massive difference between the guys who have studied uh, IIT and software engineering at university and the guys who stopped at senior six. Over the last three years, we've trained over 320, close to 320 uh, young people. Of those, we have about 83 
depending on yeah, about 83 percent uh, who are either doing their own business or who are in gainful employment so so and here's another interesting thing we are beginning to see inquiries coming in from other parts of the, the continent asking us if we can assure them that we can give them talent on a consistent basis and continuous so so so, so the, the the demand for talent is way bigger than a ugandan aspect it is an african aspect i think the world bank reports that was looking at sub saharan africa was saying close to 300 million jobs in africa are going to be digitized in one way or the other and the need for training is is massive i think we're looking at uh, close to over two billion dollars in terms of the value for training opportunities so so so, so what we're dealing with is is, is partnered now how do you work with government private sector and all the other players the, the first thing is acceptability and, and, I, and i can tell you from a private sector perspective i think that we are closing we've proved the concept we've had a number of companies hire our graduates or people have gone through our program and they realize that there is there is value for them so so from the private sector massive endorsement from the government sector side it's, it's still work in progress because we don't give an academic qualification our what is not an academic qualification our what is primarily um a skill qualification so we're trying to work with the uh, dit the director of industrial training to get this program accredited but the challenge you have with entities like dit is that they don't have the frameworks for let's say software engineering as as as, as a practice they have the low end um, levels but, but our intention is really to support them and and where possible make sure that we are we have that level of credibility of working with them so with that daniel what i can say is that when you address the issue of skill you begin to attract certain quality of work into your market and that quality of work then drives your local digital economy um that's how it works when you have a company that um that that receives 10 million dollars or 1 million dollar investment that company's requirement skill requirement is going to fundamentally change in two years um and and you have to make sure that you're ready to provide them that talent without getting them to go to india or, or that way so that's that's all i can say for now uh daniel uh thank you very much michael um we're almost coming to the end of this but i'll just simply give you a few highlights uh first and foremost we've seen that uh covid has really affected uganda's digital economy or uganda's economy generally and uh we have seen a growth or uptake in ICT and digital innovations all over the country. Um, for each of us, uh, for each of the panelists here, my question to each of you is, uh, where would you want to target the next investment in the next five years? And what outcomes would you expect? I'll start right with me in the studio, uh, Irene. For me, if I had the powers, <laughs> and I'm very passionate about bridging that gap because I believe that the digital technologies that we're building, I believe that digital economy should be accessible to each and every one. So where I would first of all put that investment is to bridge that gap to skilling programs, to education programs, bringing in both the private sector as well as the government sector to see to it that, you know, the young population and the other population at the same level, they're starting to understand the value of, of uh, digital technologies and the digital economy, because I believe that is, I could say, that's the game changer. Once we understand the value, once we have the skills, once we have the knowledge, when it comes to sensitization, it won't be so hard to tell someone that, look, your ID can be digital. Uh, you know, when it comes to people trying to play around with gadgets, it may not be as hard because people have that understanding, people have that value. So that's where I'll put my investment Then I'll definitely also look into investing in the internet because 
the internet does also play a role in, in enabling the digital economy. Uh, thank you. Let's turn over to Jacinta. Jacinta, what would you want to be your next investment in the next five years? Jacinta? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, as a regulator and somebody who is interested in the development of the financial sector and to also ensure that the, the economy is digitalized, I would look at the national switch. That is a fundamental issue right now in the sector. When we have a national switch, it means everybody will plug in. And that means even the cost uh, will, will come down because there will be a minimal cost. There will be no need of the current challenges we are having regarding interoperability. You need all these networks and all these systems to be interrelated and, and, and looped in just one place. So that would be my target. And when that is uh, um, accomplished, there has to be massive sensitization of the consumers and the members of the public of the benefits. So I think that is briefly what I would desire. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. I think that switch is a key thing that can be able to accelerate the innovation drive. Uh, let's hear from uh, Samantha. Samantha. Samantha, where would you want to put your money? Where would you want uh, the investment to be? Um, I'll iterate one of the things that also uh, uh, Michael talked about, skilling and probability. Um, obviously we obviously have a huge gap in digital skills, and that is for both basic and advanced skills. That would be one. The second one would be in um, deliberately supporting startups and innovation, because we have seen a, uh, a huge number of tech startups pushing um, in innovation in the, in, in the digital space and really disrupting traditional businesses. Um, and then, of course, input substitution, because um, we have a lot of talent in Uganda and, and a lot of makers and artisans. Um, so, input substitution, how can we leverage um, the opportunities of our entrepreneurs um, instead of importing um, within? So, uh, digital skilling, supporting startups and innovations, and then input substitution. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me just get to uh, Rugunda. Rugunda, I know you're, you're so much passionate about blockchain. I don't want to guess what you're going to, your next investment would be, but I would just like to pose the question to you. Where would you want uh, the next investment to be? Uh, Michael in blockchain. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, I would uh, uh, focus on three things. Uh, the first is infrastructure. And infrastructure, that means um, electricity, connectivity, uh, national switch, as Jacinta was mentioning. So infrastructure is key. Uh, the second is access. Access is very important. Um, digital literacy, skilling, uh, affordability, things like that. Um, input substitution, cybersecurity. And then the third and, and critically important is ecosystem development. And um, here, the point that was just being made about startups being supported, access to capital, access to mentorship, um, access for their digital products and services. So those are the three things I would focus on. Infrastructure, access, and then ecosystem development. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me give the floor lastly to Michael, who can be able to tell us uh, what uh, level or what investments he would want for the country. Michael? I would copy and paste everything else that has been said. Um, uh, I think everything has been said, if I could put it that way. Uh, the, the critical stuff has already been raised. And so so for me, I think one of the areas that I would, I would invest in as, 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 as a last point is digital transformation leadership. Because you can have good infrastructure, you can have good systems, you can have everything in. But if leadership is not aligned, it will be a struggle. So, so it is important that we get our local government leaders understand how technology can contribute and for them to get demand. So in a nutshell, I would say demand activation because the reason why you find somebody that has a school app and is only serving 20 schools is just because the leadership in most of the schools haven't fully appreciated the possibility and the potential of that technology. So, so, so that for me is another area that I would, I would, I would invest in and, and is extremely, extremely critical. 
um, and, and, and everything else that has been said by my fellow panelists. But it's been a pleasure being part of this, and, and I hope we can move from the conversation to action and, and that they get, make sure everybody is, is, is aligned. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, thank you very much, uh, all our respective panelists. I would just like to highlight uh, what uh, the future of the digital economy is. Um, we have uh, a special, one thing that has been set special for science, technology, and innovation is uh, the breakdown of, uh, the, of uh, the digital economies, uh, of the economies uh, by the Ministry of STI. And I uh, would like to appreciate the fact that our government set up uh, a scientific coordination uh, place uh, for all respective innovations, and uh, the digital economy is one of the is one of them, which is going to be run directly under the secretariat of uh, the Ministry of Science, Technology, and Innovation Office of the President, which is going to which is aimed at creating an enabling environment and a coordination center for innovation, science, and technologies. And the office is open, and this is the first time that I'm seeing a drastic drive, a drastic campaign of, uh, of technology. And one thing is that I would like to thank our president, uh, His Excellency Yoweri Kaguta Museveni, uh, for being the front, uh, the, on the front line for driving uh, innovation, science, and technology in the country. What can, we do with, what can we do without technology? Uganda has for long been known as a hub, but a lot of technical expertise have been leaving the country, and this is the time to advocate that let's come back and build Uganda's digital economy. Let's come back and build Uganda's science and technology space. And with that, I'd like to thank our media team who has been working tirelessly with this, and also the Office of the President and the Minister of uh, Science, Technology and Innovation uh, for making this happen. All of you are all welcome, and thank you very much once again. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Recording stopped.